Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. I'm Dave Marshall and this is episode 70, The Golden Age of Dinosaur Discovery, which Liz recorded with Dr. David Evans, who's Associate Professor at the University of Toronto and Curator at the Royal Ontario Museum. So, you're all probably be thinking, just when is the golden age of dinosaur discovery? And the easy answer to that is probably now, but the real question is, why is it now? And that's going to be the focus of this interview. But before we get into it, we just have the usual pieces of admins get through first. Uh, firstly, we've managed to get control of our website back after being hacked. So uh, thanks to everyone who supported us during that time, and especially to all those who donated money. It really was appreciated. Secondly, the Virtual Natural History Museum is coming along really nicely, and the website architecture is now completed. Uh, we've even had the pleasure of being able to explore the albeit empty museum. Uh, the user interface is everything I ever could have hoped it would be and just being able to run around with a group of your friends is entertaining enough in itself. So now the only thing we've left to do is to populate it with the world's paleontological multimedia which uh, shouldn't be too much of a big job should it. And then finally we've paleocast members attending SVP in Salt Lake City at the end of the month so if you're going as an academic with a story to tell or if you know of someone you want us to try and interview just send us a message and we'll see what we're able to do. So we've long passed the golden age of lengthy paleocast introductions, so I'll just remind you to look at our website for the images to support this interview and to like and share it on social media. We hope you enjoy this episode. actually in Toronto at the Royal Ontario Museum with David Evans, who's the curator of vertebrate paleontology. Thank you for sitting down with me today, David. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and how you got into paleontology and how you got to the ROM? Well, I'm curator at the ROM here and I'm in, I, my specialty is dinosaurs. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm basically living my childhood dream. <laughs> Um, I actually saw dinosaurs for the first time when I was about four years old here at the Royal Ontario Museum. And, and uh, like, like many kids, um, I was bit by the dinosaur bug, and I never looked back. Um, my family lived uh, about an hour and a half from Toronto towards Niagara Falls um, until I was about 10. And so uh, my uncle brought me here when I was four, and um, I, got, you know, I, I still remember the amazing duckbill dinosaur room mm -hmm. uh here at the rom which is which is images are are pretty famous around the world and they had a great mosasaur um exhibit um that was quite moody and it recreated an ancient sea and mm -hmm. um yeah and from that that moment on uh you know i knew i wanted to be a, a paleontologist and uh, as i grew up i got um inspired by people like phil curry uh, and dale russell and peter <laughs> dodson and um, you know, these great paleontologists who are amazing researchers and contributed hugely mm -hmm. to our understanding of, uh, of these animals, uh, but also were amazing at, uh, at reaching out to the public. And I was just, mm. I was a voracious um, reader of dinosaur <laughs> books and um, dinosaur documentaries and so on. And um, I was basically... I heard when I was a kid, I was a friend of the Trail Museum. I was five mm. years old when it opened in 1985. And uh, shortly thereafter, they started a couple of public programs where you could go and dig dinosaurs mm. uh, with Phil Curry and the, and the team. And I basically waited until I was 18 and could, could sign up for one of these, go on mm. a dinosaur dig to Dinosaur Park. Mm. And as soon as I turned 18... I took all the money that I'd saved up and I, had, <laughs> and I, I, I enrolled in the field experience program. And, and, uh, that summer, 1998, I met, uh, I met Phil Curry and I met Michael Ryan who really took me under his wing. Yeah. And, uh, the next summer I had a job at the trail museum and, uh, mm -hmm. I was a second year undergrad at the university of British Columbia at that point, mm -hmm. no vertebrate paleontologist. Yeah. Um, so I asked if I could do theses with them. And yeah. so, Don and Michael and and uh, Dave Eberth and Phil yeah. um, 
gave me duckbill projects and that's how I got into to working on duckbills mm. from Alberta and and uh, yeah and then as I was doing my PhD I the, the job here came up and uh, I was in Toronto by that time working on the duckbills here and uh, and just yeah I still pinch myself when I think about it they hired me when I was 25 <laughs> and I can't I can't even imagine what they were thinking of basically hired a kid um, to be in charge of of the dinosaur program here. But I think it's worked out pretty well. Yeah. I mean, you're definitely lucky to think I grew up in Alberta and just got to go to Dinosaur Provincial Park for the first time like two weeks ago. And you got to go when you were 18. Yeah. Uh I'm very jealous. Yeah. And the first, the first quarry I ever worked in was a Displetosaurus quarry, Uh. uh, which was pretty cool. My first day in Dinosaur Park. And then my second day I was, uh, I was whisked away to, um, southern Alberta to work in the Old Man Formation um, along the Milk River, Milk yeah. River Ridge, and uh, with Michael Ryan digging up new, a new ceratopsian, and, and that's really led into uh, my field work today, which mm. uh, Michael and I have been, been been working in southern Alberta for the last twelve years in a major project, mm-hmm. and, which has been amazingly fun and, and successful. Yeah. I think we've got six or eight new dinosaurs in the last five years from that project, which is, which is incredible. Yeah. What kind of dinosaurs, do they kind of span all dinosaurs or just ceratopsians or? Yeah, we're, we, we're focusing on that area of the Milk River uh, because it has rocks that are older than the heavily prospected and sampled rocks of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Okay. And uh, the even younger rocks. Uh, from around Drumheller, mm-hmm. and, and they correspond to a time period of the Santonian and early to middle Campanian, uh, about uh, 85 to 75 million years ago. Mm-hmm. That's not just poorly sampled in Alberta or in uh, North America, but generally globally. Mm. And so, um, you know, this was very directed. Um, we thought that if we focused on these rocks, which hadn't been worked very much in the past, but had produced some fragmentary fossils, yeah. that if we just got boots on the ground uh, and put some effort in, that uh, we would find something that would fill in this sort of major gap temporally we have in the dinosaur yeah. record uh, and maybe help us to answer some questions about the origin of these sort of ceratopsian and duckbill tyrannosaur dominated faunas, which mm. uh, you know our, everybody knows today is sort of classic. Uh, late Cretaceous faunas, but they all set themselves up in that early late Cretaceous window. Okay. Uh, and uh, we've been finding some really neat primitive um, ceratopsids mm-hmm. um, that have shed light on how um, uh, that group attained its you know characteristic ornamentation of the of the skull and frill. Uh, we found the oldest dome headed dinosaur, mm-hmm. um, which has told us a lot about not just the evolution of that group, but preservation of small bodied ornithischians in general. Um, and uh, we've also found some small bodied ornithopods, no good theropods yet. <laughs> um, but I'm, ho- I'm hoping that, uh, that, uh, we can find some new theropods. Actually, just last year we got a nice Displetosaurus skeleton yeah. from a bit younger beds, uh, which is awesome. Not a new species, but, but it's our first good theropod yeah. project. Doesn't always have to be a new species. No. You can find cool new old things, new old things. Um, so you've kind of mentioned before, which is what we wanted to talk about, was this golden age of dinosaur discovery. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by that and kind of what the background of that is? Um, yeah, I guess it was a couple of years ago. I, um, somebody was asked in an interview, um, and yeah. they said, oh, you know, we were doing an interview. I think it was about Xenoceratops, one of the mm. new di- ceratopsians that we had found. And uh, I had mentioned that, you know, we had we actually have found a whole bunch of new dinosaurs and uh, we have many more that we have in the lab that we're that are awaiting to get names. Mm. Um, and that, uh, you know, what people might not know is we're actually in sort of a, a, a second golden age of dinosaur discovery in Alberta. Mm. And I think that that is certainly emblematic of what's going on worldwide in terms of uh, finding new and exciting dinosaur mm-hmm. fossils. And um, we are sort of tracking it by just numbers of species that we've discovered. Yeah. Um, in the last 10 years in Alberta, there's been over a dozen new dinosaurs that have been oh. discovered. And if you look at that in graph form, you know, numbers of species over the last 100 years, the rate at which we're discovering new species, it's exponential now. 
and it hasn't been higher since the great Canadian dinosaur rush of the 1910s and 1920s. And it shows no signs of abating. Mm. And if you look globally, um, you see a very similar pattern. The last 10 to 15 years, Hmm. um, the numbers of new dinosaur species that are being found is just off the charts. We find somewhere between 30 and 50 new species a year, um, on average about one every two weeks. Hmm. And um, there's no sign of that slowing down. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in dinosaurs, you, you couldn't, you couldn't be alive at a better time. We're making more discoveries than we ever have been at a rate that's virtually unparalleled since, you know, the classic, uh, uh, classic paleontologists worked in the late um, 1800s and early 1900s. Why is that? Why is it in the last 10 years that this has been happening so much? Is it just because more people are going out and looking or technology or what? what is kind of the reason behind it? Now, I think there are multiple reasons behind it. Um, I think, I think one of the major reasons, um, is just simply political and economic. Mm. So a lot of the new discoveries that we're seeing are from places like, uh, South America Mm -hmm. and and China. Um, and they are investing in paleontology more than they ever have. Mm. Um, and there are more paleontologists in those areas that can explore their backyards and they've developed amazing homegrown paleontology programs that 50 years ago, they, they just weren't there. They just weren't that numerous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you are on top of the fossils or close to the the fossil bearing rocks, um, you know, you find more, more stuff. Um, but I think it's, I think it's more than that. I think the public interest in dinosaurs has a lot to do, um, with the current golden age that we're in. Mm. Um, and I think that that probably owes its roots to, um, Jurassic Park, probably there's yeah. a, I'm sure a Jurassic Park effect to this, um, that ever since, you know, 1993, when the first movie came out, um, the public interest in dinosaurs just shot up hugely mm. and it hasn't looked back. And I think that that's, um, over the last, geez, 20 years or so, yeah. um, it's taken a while to, 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 to sort of get hold, but that I think huge public appetite for dinosaurs has resulted in, in more positions uh, at universities mm. and at museums for dinosaur workers specifically. And uh, there's a whole new generation of young dinosaur workers that have that have been hired in the last 10 years. Yeah, I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> I was sort of, I think, maybe one of the earlier ones that was hired, but there's a lot of new great young researchers who are getting positions mm. who are trying to um, not only establish themselves, but also have this appetite for exploration and, um, and thirst for knowledge to fill in these gaps. And they're going to places that have been poorly explored and we're able to get to places that have never been explored. Yeah. And um, as a result, we're having more discoveries made. So um, we have more people um, who are who are aware of the gaps that we have in the fossil record and mm-hmm. going directly to, to rocks to sample them. And I think that's also resulting in in uh, in a lot of these these new discoveries. Yeah. I mean, I just thinking from a personal level, I was six when Jurassic Park came out. And at the time, you know, I wasn't a big fan. And actually, I wasn't a big dinosaur crazy kid at all. But looking back on it, you know, there's so many people my age that are going into paleo and want to be, you know, professors and stuff. And they all say, well, I grew up watching Jurassic Park. Yeah, I can think of... (laughs) probably 10 people right now who say that one of their big influences was Jurassic Park. Yeah. Um, and I, I was, I was bit by the bug before Jurassic Park. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a real big influence on me, Yeah. but uh, even a lot of my, uh, a lot of my graduate students for sure, mm-hmm. um, who are only five or 10 years, five years behind me, Jurassic Park was a big deal yeah. um, for them. And, you know, I'm okay with that. I mean, it really, it portrayed dinosaurs in, a way that um, was the most scientifically accurate um, representation of them that had ever been done. Yeah. Uh, some of it was provocative. Some of it pushed <laughs> the envelope a little bit, um, but it really brought them to life. Um, you know, an interesting, you asked about technology mm. as being potentially related to this. And, yeah. you know, one of the, one of the, 
one of the talks that I often give is how to dig up a dinosaur. And I yeah. start with that um, scene in Jurassic Park where uh, they're using the ground penetrating radar and, you know, pretty soon we're not going to have to dig anymore. And yeah. Grant goes, what's the fun in that? You know? <laughs> and uh, I couldn't agree more, but you know, that is technology has really not played a huge role. Mm-hmm. I would argue in um, the, in the increasing rate of discoveries. I mean, yeah. how often do we use ground penetrating radar now? Yeah. Almost never. Yeah. I mean, Never. No. Probably less than was used in the immediate aftermath of Jurassic yeah. Park. And, um, you know, when we're in the field, we, you know, I think it's just getting, I think, it, I think where technology has played a role is just accessibility mm-hmm. into areas um, like the Gobi Desert or like mm-hmm. the Arctic. These places are getting much more eat, much more accessible than they were even 25 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, the, you know, getting to the rocks is one of the most fundal, fundamental parts of, of finding fossils. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the work I do is in Sudan mm. and there's obviously some political barriers mm-hmm. there, um, but it's getting easier and easier to get into the Sahara, for instance, or, or into the Gobi. It's amazingly easy to get into the Gobi. <laughs> um, and, and, and I've done some work there and, and I think that that has, has played a role. I mean, it, 25 yeah. years ago, it was really hard yeah. to get to the Arctic. And now, you know, I guess, Climate change is our friend in some ways. The field season is lengthening, and, and but it's becoming much easier to get yeah. to those places. So in terms of actual new species discoveries, maybe technology doesn't play a big role, but it does kind of increase what we can do with the fossils. So is it also showing an increase in just general large-scale studies, or is it just in terms of discovering yeah. a new species? For this um, golden age, I guess. No, I, I think that the, I guess, the the age of discovery that we're in now is certainly hugely promoted and facilitated mm. by uh, new technologies yeah. to to um, to analyze the material yeah. big, uh, big time. Um, if we're sort of tracking it as number of species as a proxy, yeah, we can talk about that. But if we're talking about just the amount of research that's coming out, I think new technology is playing a huge role yeah. in our understanding everything from being able to 3d model, uh, you know, CT scan, 3d model, mm. um, uh, you know, endocasts or, or skulls to mm-hmm. do et- to find an element analysis and so on. I mean, these have played a huge role yeah. uh, in, in, uh, in understanding the biology of the animals. Do you think that there's a general increase in the number of big papers coming out as well, or is just discovery in species? Well, I think the number of papers coming out is, yeah is it's it's massive yeah it's really hard to keep up these days yeah it is <laughs> they're just and there's so many students now too i mean the number mm. of you know the 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 number of new prof- professors and curators and that have been hired of course that cascades down and they all have students and labs and so yeah. on and you know those you know graduate students are doing such amazing work now cutting edge work and any one pi has multiple graduate students. And yeah. so when you sort of put all that together, um, the amount of science that's yeah. being done, um, whether, you know, in paleontology or other, uh, in other sciences is just, it's, it's massive. Yeah. Thinking about the Jurassic park effect, of course, the main thing is dinosaurs and you mainly work on dinosaurs, but do you think it's affected the number of things be- being discovered like new species of pterosaurs or mosasaurs or marine reptiles or anything like that as well? Um, I would say absolutely. Yeah. Um, You know, my motivation of going to Northern Sudan, um, which is a cool project I've been involved in over the last five years with colleagues in Berlin Hmm. uh, and Sudan um, was to, uh, you know, my main interest was going there to find dinosaurs from the late Cretaceous in Africa, uh, which are extremely rare. And, and, we found we found some fragmentary dinosaurs, but we found tons of crocodilians and turtles that are mm. new to science. And so we've actually been concentrating on writing those up. There's some right here on the desk. <laughs> um, and uh, it's dragged me into working on on crocodiles. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I think that whenever whenever I go out and, and do field work, and I think this is the case with, with all of us, is that we don't just collect the taxon that we're interested in we pick sure. everything up yeah. um, that might be of interest and and um, as far as dinosaurs it might be collateral damage or whatever but we're <laughs> finding all sorts of cool cool stuff in fact in alberta we uh i remember wendy Sloboda, who's just amazing at finding fossils 
she thought she had found a keening aphid, a mm-hmm. raptorosaur, um, and she had it in her hands, and she thought I was going to be really excited. And she's like, I've got something, you're going to love this. She put it into my hands, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, a turtle? <laughs> and uh, she goes, ah, oh, damn, I thought that was uh, an over-after. And it turned out to be a brand new genus and species of sea turtle that Don ah. Rafeman named ah. um, after her again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good example of how just being out there, um, you know, you don't just find, you know, you don't just find one thing, you find the whole fauna. And, and it's, I think it's just as important to understand everything that lived with the dinosaurs as it did the dinosaurs themselves sure. because you have to understand them in an ecological context. Sure. You know, we've talked a little bit about your work in Alberta and now a little bit in Sudan as well. Um, are there other places around the world you've been able to work in, stemming from this kind of new, exciting, getting money to go and do field work? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say the, the, the one that certainly is tied to, to, to this, I, this idea uh, most closely is I've done some work in the Canadian Arctic ah. and um, that's benefited from government funding through the Polar Continental Shelf Project, cool. which uh, provides logistical support for getting up there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is some political reasons why more money is going towards our Arctic exploration as, mm. uh, you know, as well as scientific ones. Um, you know, there's a sovereignty uh, question with Canada and mm-hmm. the U S and Russia and the, um, Northern, uh, Northwest passage and so on. And it's actually benefited scientists because the Canadian government among all sorts of other, um, mandates wants to get more people up there. Yeah. And, uh, we've got a number of, of grants to go up to, uh, to the Arctic to cool. look for fossils. And with climate change, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, there is less ice there um for uh, for longer periods of time mm-hmm. and the field season which was once really short is in the last 30 years has gotten much longer mm-hmm. um and those areas of course uh in the canadian arctic specifically have lots of mesozoic aged yeah. rock that is almost certainly filled with great fossils um there's a lot of marine sediment up there so plesiosaurs and um, yeah but uh, there's also some marginal marine and some terrestrial stuff. And we found some cool stuff in, uh, in the uh, Yukon and the Northwest Territories and on my expeditions. What kind of material com- have you been finding from there? Uh, mostly fragmentary stuff. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, it's been a bit frustrating. Uh. Um, I was hoping to go to the Northern Yukon and Northwest Territories and find um, basically North Slope Alaska type deposits, which are incredibly rich in, yeah. in dinosaurs, big bone beds of duck bills yeah. and horned dinosaurs uh, from a really interesting time period, um, right close to the, the KT boundary. And um, we found bits and pieces. And uh, I worked with Hans Larsen up on Bylot Island for a year and mm-hmm. bits and pieces again. And at some point, someone is going to be up there and just going to blow the lid off of it yeah. um, and find a, you know great skeletons. Um, yeah. But actually, I've just because of how intense the logistics are, I haven't gone back for a few years yeah. because it's sort of an investment versus return. Sure. And Alberta has been returning like crazy. <laughs> and uh, so is the Sudan. And it just has sort of fallen yeah. off. But there's tremendous potential up there. Yeah. Tremendous potential. I have a friend who does field work on Svalbard. And oh, she cool. does a lot of work on um, marine reptiles from there. And they only get like two weeks of field season per year. So it surprises me that the Arctic is having more than that because I would expect expect it to be similar to Svalbard. But I don't know if it's just yeah. not as far north as Svalbard or what it is because they only go out for two weeks a year. Yeah, I don't know what the local conditions are, but yeah. you, you certainly can get a good month up in the Arctic wow. Islands. Um, if, you know, and I don't even think you have to be necessarily that lucky to do that yeah. um, anymore. Hmm. I've certainly spent a month up, uh, up there and yeah. we got a re- reasonably decent field season. So hmm. that's impressive. Um, just going back to kind of Alberta and, uh, other things that you've been up to, you in the last couple of years did a bit of a TV show related to some stuff down in Alberta with Dino Hunt Canada. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how that kind of came to be and what it was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dino Hunt Canada is a really fun project and it, it was, its genesis was uh, basically a, a coffee conversation with a producer. 
uh, as many of these things are. And uh, we had just done a very successful um, dinosaur exhibition here called Ultimate Dinosaurs, mm. um, which uh, we're very proud of. We is a homegrown exhibition, and it it's it explored why the southern dinosaurs that are being being found uh, in places like Patagonia and Africa and Madagascar are just so wildly different from the, mm. the T-Rex and Triceratops we're familiar with. And it mm-hmm. sort of talked about vicariant evolution and the breakup of Pangaea and how, you know, life on earth is so, is intimately related to the evolution of the earth itself. Mm-hmm. And, um, they, uh, history channel, um, approached a couple of production companies and said that they'd be interested in doing a series on dinosaurs and to talk to us. And, um, they, uh, they were interested in doing something with ultimate dinosaurs, I think. And, um, the, and I said, well, I mean, this is all cool, but you would, you wouldn't believe, um, the amazing discoveries that are being made right here in Canada. And, you know, there are, um, six or eight field teams that go out, uh, specifically to look for dinosaurs. Yeah. And, um, a lot of the, the, the principal investigators are young people like me and they're exploring areas that have been poorly explored uh, and they're finding all sorts of cool things. Mm -hmm. And it would be a really neat idea to do a documentary that was sort of like a day in the life of a field paleontologist in Canada, Um, but more of like a field season in the, in the life of, so they could visit uh, not only um, our camp on the milk river, but they could visit, you know, Phil Curry in Dinosaur Park, and they mm-hmm. could visit Hans Larsen in Saskatchewan, and um, Rich McRae and Lisa Buckley in BC, and uh, uh, Tim Fedek in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. And you could sort of start in the early Jurassic, and you could kind of work your way. You know, you skip some time, but go through the uh, the late Cretaceous right up to the KT boundary. Mm. And they were surprised to hear that that you know that all these new species were being discovered and. Um, I offered they could come up and watch us dig up a new species of horn dinosaur, which ultimately turned out to be Wendy Ceratops. Uh-huh. And uh, they said, oh, okay, well, let, yeah, we'll, let, we'll pitch that to history and see what they say. And um, I don't, I didn't really have much hope for it. <laughs> um, and so I was just, I was blown away when they came back and they said, yeah, well, we decided not to do one documentary, but they wanted <laughs> to do four. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is awesome. You know, what a great way to showcase, you know, yeah. all the, all the great talent and that we have in Canada and, um, all the amazing fossil beds yeah. and to tie it to this, uh, you know, really deep history that we have in terms of paleontology, but also in terms of the paleontologists. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so each episode, they did four episodes and they, they took, um, they basically split it so each episode had had uh, had two teams. Okay. And did exactly that. They started in, or well, they actually didn't start in Nova Scotia. They started with us in the Milk River, but ultimately, it covered from the early Jurassic right up to the extinction of the dinosaurs, hmm. and uh, it uh, it turned out, I think, turned out pretty well. Yeah. Um, getting back to sort of those those old time documentaries of 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 watching scientists work and and explain yeah. how we know what we know rather than the walking with dinosaurs yeah style did they do eight different teams then so two different teams per episode yeah they, they did that but but phil got <laughs> phil got two he got a two for, of course which did. makes sense <laughs> and uh they yeah they did that and then once it started to take shape um history got pretty excited about what they were getting mm. and uh we applied for a big grant to do a a, a companion website and yeah. to do an exhibit, mm. and so uh, that was exciting. On the website, we highlighted the the highlight dinosaurs in the in the series mm-hmm. um, that came up, and uh, so there's sort of a dinosaur dictionary of some of the uh, the big Canadian dinosaurs, mm-hmm. uh, and then we also though took people from the field into the lab, and. Uh, took them through the process of actually preparing a fossil mm. and and getting it ready for display. Yeah. And then we opened the display at the museum. And so uh, I think one of the most innovative things that uh, we did as part of that project is that we did a live stream of the preparators mm-hmm. preparing the new species. Mm-hmm. So you could actually look through the 
oculars of a microscope and over the shoulder of a technician cleaning a bone um, and revealing its surface that, you know, no one had ever seen before. And you could do that in, re- yeah. in real time. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was pretty cool um, yeah. for me, wherever I was in the world. Um, I could always check on whether my technicians were working, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, which was also cool. Um, but yeah, that, so, so it was great. And, um, ultimately, uh, we were nominated for a Canadian screen award, which is like the Canadian Emmys for it. And because I was a, I, they, they called me a, a producer or no, wait a minute, a developer. <laughs> and anyways, this was crazy. Um, I never ever in a million years thought I would be um, nominated for a TV award, but it was nominated for best cross platform production. Hmm. And so doing TV web and an exhibit is something that was quite novel. We didn't win, um, but it was pretty neat to be nominated for something like that. Yeah. Not, not something you normally think of for a paleontologist to get there. Yeah. I certainly (laughs) didn't expect it. Uh, The new species that you talked about, uh, in the show and then eventually turned into that new exhibit is Wendy Ceratops. Can you talk a little bit about that discovery and a bit about that really awesome specimen? Yeah, Wendy Ceratops has definitely been one of the highlight discoveries of my career. It was really cool to be a part of it. Of course, I didn't make it myself. <laughs> um, that The initial fossils were uh, made or were discovered by Wendy Sloboda mm-hmm. and um, she's a legendary fossil hunter in Alberta. Um, she found her first uh, fossils when she was a teenager, and her first big discovery was the Devil's Coulee mm. egg nesting site, uh, which were, which included the first eggs with embryos in it in them in North America. Wow! And she discovered those when I think she was sixteen. Wow! Yeah, pretty wild. Yeah. And she went on to work for the Trail Museum, and uh, she moved on from there. And but she's a uh, homegrown talent she were, she lives in a small farming town in in southern southern alberta mm-hmm. and um, i worked with her when i worked at the trail museum when i was a, a student and uh, of course michael's worked with her michael ryan for a while and she's been joining us in the field at, uh, every year of our southern alberta dinosaur project for the last mm-hmm. 12 years and we joke that we're wendy's cleanup crew <laughs> uh, because she runs around the Badlands, and she just has the sixth sense for finding important specimens. And uh, yeah, so we basically, Wendy finds the stuff and we dig it up, and we don't complain because she always finds amazing stuff. And that's the way the Wendy Ceratops uh, story started is uh, she was out prospecting and she found uh, a couple of pieces of skull of, uh, of Ceratopsian. And she brought them to um, Michael and I. And we both knew instantly. We're like, "Whoa, this is really neat." You could see some of the ornamentation mm-hmm. on the on the frill, and they were, it was kind of curving forward. Mm-hmm. And we thought, "Oh, that's really weird." And and um, and sh- and we asked her where she found it, and she found it basically, you know, right on top of the foremost formation, right at the very bottom of the old man formation. And um, that's when the sort of the uh, the light bulbs went off, and we got really excited uh, because we knew that th- that that would be some of the oldest hmm. ceratopsid from that family uh, material ever found. And we knew that it, we, we suspected based on what, what she had already found that it was probably something new. And uh, so Wendy took us to the site and it was a, a low density bone bed. And uh, it was relatively easy digging preserved in a, a mudstone. But it was at the base of this hill that was like <laughs> vertical and a hundred feet tall, oh. <laughs> and we had to spend well over a full field season jackhammering Jeez. this hill. It's the biggest quarry oh. that I've ever been involved with, and uh, it was a risk, um, but uh, it really paid off. We collected mm. over two hundred bones from this bone bed. We got about fifty percent of the skeleton, including a lot of. The important parts of the skull, we got an almost complete frill of multiple ontogenic stages. And we also got, what was really exciting, we also got part of the nose horn, a good chunk of it. And enough to say that it had a tall, erect nose horn. Mm. And um, this is pretty characteristic of ceratopsians. When we think of ceratopsians, mm-hmm. we think of, you know, Centrosaurus mm-hmm. um, or Triceratops or, you know, 
Styracosaurus, whatever, has these big nose horns. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that this specimen from Wendy Ceratops is the oldest record of a of a nose horn, a proper nose horn in, mm-hmm. in the family. And when you put it together with uh, some other new discoveries, a lot of the primitive centrosaurs, which are these short frilled horn dinosaurs that mm-hmm. Wendy Ceratops is part of, um, they actually don't have nose horns. And um, it was interesting because when you actually put it together, it looks like the nose horn and horn dinosaurs evolved twice. Hmm. Once in chasmosaurines, which include uh, triceratops, mm-hmm. and then once in the short frilled um, centrosaurs. And so they got their nose horns by convergent evolution. Hmm. And it told us something about how horn dinosaurs acquired their characteristic horn dinosaur faces, ceratops mm. horn dinosaur horn face. Um, that we really didn't know before, and it gave us a, hmm. a mark in the road as to when, at least minimally, that uh, that feature evolved in that lineage. So um, it painted an interesting picture about the evolution of ornamentation in the group. Um, it also has this wicked frill with these big <laughs> droopy hooks that that adorn the entire margin. And um, when we got all this prepped out, we were, of course really excited and. We had, to, we had to name it something totally different from anything anyone had seen before. And we played around with names, that, um, but Wendy is just such a force of nature. Mm. And um, she's found so many things in her career, over 3,000 specimens at the Terrell wow. Museum alone. But she never had a dinosaur named after her. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we just had to. Yeah. And of course, you know, Wendy is, she's quite, you know, she's quite the, the character. Um, she's completely covered in tattoos. She has dreadlocks. And uh, the after the paper came out, the name was official. Um, next time I saw Wendy, she had she jumps out of the truck and she has this giant tattoo on her forearm <laughs> of the reconstruction of Wendy Ceratops <laughs> by Danielle Dufault, who's an amazing <laughs> paleo artist. And she gave me a big hug and she goes, she shows off the tattoo. She's like, I've been waiting. <laughs> this has been for my dinosaur. <laughs> And, uh, and finally we were able to get Wendy a tattoo of her dinosaur. (laughs) Did she know about it before you named it or did she find out when everyone else did? (laughs) No, she, right before we were, as we were sort of deciding the name and Wendy Ceratops is actually kind of a placeholder name. It sort of started as, oh, we'll call it Wendy Ceratops. And and we tried to think of something better and honor her, you know, maybe in the specific epithet. We just, we, it just sort of grew on us. Yeah. You know, a dinosaur is known by its genus name, and so we yeah. thought, you know, this is the best way to yeah. to give Wendy her props. And so the the week before we submitted the paper, said, "Hey, would you be comfortable with this?" And she was, of course, thrilled. Yeah. Um, um, but I didn't ever, you know, I didn't think that she would basically get a tattoo right away. <laughs> um, obviously, the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project has been quite successful for you guys. Is it something that you're planning on continuing for a while? Do you still have lots of money for it? Or are you kind of planning on finishing it up anytime soon? We are we are doing really well. Yeah. And um, we have no plans of stopping anytime soon. Getting money is something we do year to year. Okay. So uh, we apply for all of our money yeah. uh, each year. Um, yeah, but... So far, so good. We've yeah. been l- lucky to, enough to cobble together enough funds to do it. It's not horribly um, expensive. No. And um, we actually had our very best year of the t- of our 12 years last year. Okay. Um, and so we have so much to do. Yeah. Uh, we just keep building up um, data, the database of sites that we have to execute. But last year we found this Displetosaurus skeleton. We found a beautiful Lambiosaur. Completely articulated. Wow. First one from the old man formation. Wow. We found a new species of critosaur like hadrosaur, uh, an associated skeleton. And uh, we are digging up another new horned dinosaur bone bed. All of these found by Wendy. Wow. <laughs> of course. <Jeez. laughs> uh, and then the last day of the season, Wendy found a completely three-dimensionally preserved mummified duckbill. Wow. Uh, which is totally jaw-dropping. Huh. Um, amazing. Uh, skin just completely covering uh, the, the, the skeleton. Wow. Um, it, it was eroded out in blocks from a sandstone concretion. Uh, but we think we have the skull, and uh, we have just 
phenomenal skin impressions from the whole thing. Mm. So we were really excited to get back into the field and we're headed there in two weeks okay. and uh, to continue working on all these things. We started all the quarries last year yeah. um, and uh, and we're just excited to get back. Yeah. Uh, we also found two new pachycephalosaur species <laughs> and oh yeah, the first articulated Santonian aged dinosaur from the Milk River Formation, which is a wow. Big, uh, yeah, it's almost embarrassing to say how good we did. Uh, and almost all of them were found by Wendy Sloboda. Wow. So when you go out there, how long is the field season typically? Our field seasons are typically four to six weeks. Okay. Um, and we typically run crew about uh, 15 to 20 people. Okay. And so we'll work three quarries and usually have like a prospecting sort of geology team. Yeah. Um that uh, that um, runs section and and, yeah. and looks for stuff. Um, Wendy will never sit in a quarry, <laughs> and that is not the best use of Wendy's time. <laughs> so we, there's usually a prospecting crew with Wendy uh, or a geology crew, and then uh, and then there's the quarries. Is it the same fifteen people for the whole time, or do you rotate out? No, we cycle out quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Um, we cycle out quite a bit, and uh, Michael and I uh, have a number of students at different levels that we cycle cycle yeah. through, uh, and we often have visitors like Phil Curry comes down. Yeah, um, he's quite excited to work on the display disorder, so he's <laughs> visiting course. us for a week, and he'll bring a few of his students. And yeah. um, we have a good good core group of volunteers. Yeah, that join us in the field as well. Yeah. So we like to get them in. Um, yeah, so it's it's always busy and exciting, and yeah. and always cool stuff is being found, and it's. That's my favorite place. Yeah. So if the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project is doing really well, uh, do you think that this kind of prime dinosaur discovery age is going to continue for a while? Or is it something that's kind of wrapping up or at yeah. risk of slowing down anytime yeah. soon? Um, I haven't ran the numbers. I've ran yeah, the numbers sure. in, in Canada. Yeah. And um, I know what's on the horizon in Canada. And... Um, you know, if numbers of species discovered um, is a good proxy for just overall research output, mm. um, there, it, you know, we're in this exponential phase yeah. right now, and uh, there's no sign of it slowing down uh, in Canada, and I don't think there's any sign of it slowing down globally. Um, I think that we're going to continue this really rapid pace of of discovery uh, for probably uh, a decade or so to come, at least. Good news for people looking for jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, that's that's really great. I I mean, I knew that there were lots of species coming out, of course, but I didn't realize really how many and how many of them were coming out from Canada too. So. Yeah, I mean, people are surprised of that, that that number in Canada because if there's any place you think that um, has been prospected out or played mm. out in terms of the dinosaur beds, sure. I mean, you might think Alberta. I mean, there's been you know multiple crews every year for the last hundred years yeah um, that have worked there um but it turns out that they've focused you know if you look at sort of the historical arc a lot of those crews have gone to the same places dinosaur sure. provincial park or drumheller over and over again yeah um they've made discoveries elsewhere but because the riches of dinosaur park are just so incredible yeah um They've sort of it's like kind of like a a, you know, a magnet or something. Yeah. They're drawn to yeah. you know collecting the fiftieth articulated specimen of Corythosaurus, which is cool. Um, but you know it takes a lot more work to come up with something that uh, you know a, a, a discovery in those areas that's really significant because yeah. you just have so much um, effort uh, that's come before you. Um, but if you step outside of those really intensely prospected bubbles, you know, the Hell Creek formation mm. in, in the, the Western interior U S is another example. Um, if you step outside of those and maybe go to the places that are harder to get to, um, and maybe the fossils appear to be more fragmentary, um, that's where you can make some pretty interesting discoveries. I mean, a good example is the Kapirowitz formation and mm. the Waweep in Utah, where, you know, that was some pretty, uh, inaccessible, hard to get to, hard to work, um, outcrop. Um, and it's really been in the last 15 years, you know, with Scott Sampson, um, and his crews. And that's now carried on to that and ne ne the next generation. Um, the discoveries coming out of there are just phenomenal. Yeah. And we've known about the, 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 the Kapirowitz beds for a century, you know, for a century. Um, 
but people just haven't really worked them. Yeah. And sometimes it just takes, you know, it takes um, working a little bit harder and putting a little bit more effort into some of these yeah. these places that haven't historically been worked, but they'll produce good stuff. Um, Madagascar is another really good example. You know, yeah. We knew about the fossils um, in uh, the Monero Formation in, in uh, Madagascar for long time. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until people figured out how to collect the fossils with Dave mm. Crows that it just started to produce all this stuff. Yeah. And I think there's lots of, there's still lots of formations and lots of localities out there like that. Another great example is Uka Tolgod. I mean, people work um, Mongolia, Lake Petition Mongolia for a really long time. Um, and, you know, the AMH just stumbled across this. I mean, it's a really small area of outcrop that just produced all this crazy stuff. Hmm. And there's got to be hundreds of Uka Tolgods out there in the world that, have, that are still sure. you know, left to discover. Well, that's great. Thank you for joining me, David, and good luck on your field season, I guess, in two weeks. Thanks a lot, Liz. This has been great. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.